All right. Great. Excellent. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So we're ready. Um, Raghav, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Manny. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, I'll be talking about on-demand transportation, driver wages versus platform profit. This is joint work with Omar, Vineet, and Groot, all at Columbia. So just to get us all on the same page with the motivations, we started this work a couple of years ago when being in New York City, you're consistently seeing news articles around how drivers are making below minimum wage. And this is actually formalized in this report by Hart and Reach, uh, which was essentially conducted by New York City, the study. And based on this report, New York City enforced minimum wage regulations. And what that essentially meant is if a driver is signed in on the app, right? So you might not have a passenger at the back, but you might just be signed in the app. So that's what I'll call active. They should be paid minimum wage in expectation, right? So that's what the regulation enforced. And as a result, so you can imagine if a driver is driving in a region of low demand, the platforms will start turning them off because they can't really afford to pay minimum wage to drivers in those regions. So that's what we call by admission control. So even if the driver wants to work and is on road, the platform has this capability of just signing the driver out of the app. Right. And what ended up happening as a result is this really bad market equilibrium where drivers are really desperate to work. They were on road, but the platforms are not letting them in the apps. And obviously drivers are unhappy. They complain quite a bit. And there's some experimentation uh, by the platforms on refining this dynamic admission control policy. So as opposed to drivers showing up on road and then learning that whether they'll be allowed to be active or not. What Uber did, so this is actually a screenshot from a driver's Uber app, is let's say today is a couple of days before Friday. For the coming Friday, these are the early slots the driver can sign up for. So there's a slot for 2 to 3 p.m. that this driver can sign up on. Uh, 3 to 5 p.m. is all full, but 5 to 7 p.m. is available. Right? So the driver will claim these slots if she desires. And on Friday, she'll have the right to be active and hence earn at least minimum wage during these hours. Okay. But a more fundamental question one can ask is whether this is the right design for this market. So we have this dynamic admission control, this first come first serve style refinement of admission control. And more fundamentally, is there market design that leads to high platform profit and high driver wages? Okay. So I'll come to both these policies in a bit, for, but first let me summarize my contribution then talk about the model before doing that. Uh, so in terms of the contribution, then this would be the outline of the talk, we'll first propose a model that will capture preferences of various stakeholders in this marketplace. And I'll think of a one day time horizon and I'll discretize the day into various hours. So you can think of 24 hours and I'll let the driver riders, the demand to be price and wait time sensitive. And the platform really the operational decision it's controlling is the scheduling policy or this admission control of drivers throughout the day. And one key feature we really capture in this work is we let the drivers to be strategic agents with heterogeneous temporal preferences. So for instance, you might be a part-time driver only willing to drive, let's say in the evening rush hour, whereas I might be a full-time driver and my type is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's when I wanna drive, okay? And the scheduling policy will output these hourly slot allocation. So for me as a driver, it'll tell me what are the hours I have the right to be active on these apps. So that's the model side, and I'll get into the details in a bit. On the analysis of the existing policy, so that's dynamic control and first come first serve, we'll essentially show how this model serves as a unifying framework to analyze them, and we'll try to rigorously quantify their performance with respect to both the platform profit and the wages for the drivers. And finally, the building on the intuition we gained from this analysis, we'll try to propose a new policy that essentially refines first come first serve using a prioritization scheme 
and we'll discuss its performance guarantees and uh, show the simulations we did, which were calibrated to New York City data. Okay. So let me talk about the model and I'll decompose my model into two sites. That's the platform profit and the driver wages. Uh, for the platform profit, let me start with the riders. That's the demand. And as I said, I'll think of a one day horizon with T being 24 hours. And I have this generic demand curve, lambda T, which depends on mu T. And the way to think of mu T is that those are the number of drivers that are active during RT, right? So during the morning, let's say 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., you might have a lot of drivers that are active. And as a result, there's this demand realizes. And all I'm assuming is that this demand is concave in mu t. So that's the law of diminishing returns. Okay. And lambda t as a function, I allow to be de to depend on price and wait time. Okay. So that's a demand curve. And as a function of that, the platform has a profit function that's pi of mu. So again, mu is the active supply, which feeds into my demand curve. I multiply the realized demand by my price PT and take out the compensations or the wages I'm paying to my supply, the drivers, okay? And one thing I'll note here is this C, I'm paying the driver to just be active on the app, to just having being signed on as opposed to having a passenger at the back. So C really is taking care of this utilization. It's an effective wage per se, right? And as a, this profit function, if I maximize over mu, I get the unconstrained optimal of the supply level that I need as a platform. So that's what I'll call mu uncon. And practice, especially in major cities, you'll expect mu uncon, that's a y-axis, to have this bimodal shape across the day. So we have the morning rush hour and the evening rush hour. Okay? And really, you can think of the platform wanting to fill these slots by scheduling the drivers. So that's the platform profit side. In terms of the drivers, we have D drivers and D can be arbitrary, right? And each driver D has a private type, which captures her start time SD and the end time ED. So for example, I might be a full-time driver, my start time is 9 a.m. and end time is 5 p.m. This is the time I desire to work or desire to drive, okay? And there are two variables corresponding to each driver D. XD denotes the periods she's allocated or she's active. That's a platform decision. So that's really the admission control. And YD is my decision when I want to be on road, right? And what we assume in this work is as a driver, I want to be on road for a contiguous block. So I come on road, I work for a few hours and I go back home as opposed to working, going home, coming back on the road again during the same day and so on. So those are the primitives or the variables X and Y. And as a result, I can define the utility, right? So utility simply is the money I make minus the reservation wage. The money I make is for the hours I'm active. So the platform has to give me a slot, XD, and I have to be on road, YDT. I make C dollars for all those hours. And my reservation wage is simply the time I spend on road scaled by my, this parameter A, which is the hourly reservation page. So th th there's a key difference that I only earn when the platform lets me work, that's the X variable, but my reservation wage is also incurred, is only incurred just by me being on road, irrespective of whether I'm working or not. And a central met metric usually the regulators care about is the average effective wage on these platforms. So that's really the total money earned by drivers, that's the numerator, divided by the total time they spend on road, okay? So that's what we call average effective wage. Uh, and that's the metric uh, we care about. Just to put everything on the same page, platform profit and driver's wages, I have for profit, I have this bimodal demand that I need to fill as a platform. And I'll define the metric as a supply ratio. That's essentially the fraction of slots I fill. I'll be a bit more precise. It's not necessarily just the fraction of this slots I fill, it's a, the denominator is the first best, uh, where I relax the IC and IR. I'm skipping some details in the interest of time. So essentially what I'm trying to allude to here is 
this demand never accounted for the driver preferences. So it might be uh, too much, uh, too optimistic. You might not be able to fill it. So you can tighten this uh, demand, the denominator, uh, by computing a first best. So if you relax the IC and IR in the underlying uh, optimization, you can characterize the first best supply you need to fill. So that's the supply ratio, so always between zero and one, one being better for the profit. And on the driver side, I have an arbitrary number of drivers, the type being the times they wanna work. Again, it's private. Utility is simply earnings minus opportunity cost, and each driver is maximizing her expected utility. The, it's, uh, she's a strategic agent. And the wage ratio simply is overall drivers, how much time they spend being active or working over the time they spend on road. Right? You can think of this as the efficiency of the system. Okay? And the question we're asking is, can we design a strategy proof allocation policy that achieves a high supply ratio and a high wage ratio? And the key here, one key I'll emphasize here is the strategy proof is coming from the fact that the driver types are private. I don't know that information. Okay. So that's the model and the two performance metrics. Uh, with this setup, let me discuss the two policies I discussed on the first slide. Uh, the first one being dynamic control. And this is really, this has been the dominant practice in this market. And the way it works is, Drivers show up on road, so that's a wide decision. And in period T, the platform needs mu T unconstrained drivers. And that's what, uh, those are the number of drivers it turns on, right? So if more drivers show up on road than what the platform needs, those drivers are turned off uh, due to this admission control, okay? Uh, a simple example is you consider two drivers, one time period, and let's say there's a demand of one, right? And let's say the compensation is $20, but the reservation wage is just below 10, right? So even if both the drivers come on road, that they have half a probability, each driver has half a probability of getting the right, and the expected utility, half times 20, that's 10, minus the reservation wage, which is less than 10, is positive. Right? And as a result, both the drivers come on road. In fact, that's a unique equilibrium under dynamic control. And that leads to a bad market outcome. And that's what this news article was really referring to as this dystopic rat race that drivers don't have the certainty of priority that will they have the right to be active on the platform or not. And they have to make this decision before uh, realizing that. So one can go ahead and formalize this intuition and show that the wage ratio can be arbitrarily low under dynamic control. And the key limitation here is this lack of a prior reservation. That's the first one. And it's not just the lack of a prior reservation that's a limitation. It's that DC or dynamic control might not even prioritize the drivers properly and that can result in bad profit supply ratio. So let me illustrate that. So consider, an example with three periods, and the platform needs one driver in each period. I have two drivers, driver one and driver two. Driver one is full-time. She wants to work starting from period one to the end of period three, whereas driver two just wants to work in the middle period. She's part-time, right? One possible equilibrium under dynamic control is driver two claims the middle slot, so her allocation is just the middle slot. And because driver two claimed the middle slot, driver one either can take both the slots at the end, so one, zero, one, or can only claim one of the slots. So if driver one takes both the slots, she'll have to take the gap in between, which is undesirable for her. And one possible equilibrium is she just doesn't take the third slot that's available here. So out of the three slots, only two get filled and the supply reach is two by three in this example. Now one can formalize this intuition and show that the supply ratio can decay as two by square root T under dynamic control. And the limitation here is this improper prioritization of driver's heterogeneity. So had the platform prioritized the full-time driver, let her keep all the three slots, we wouldn't have had this limitation. Okay, so to put a picture to all the words I've said, in terms of reservation, 
and prioritization, dynamic control does poorly. It's on the bottom left. And as a result, the wage ratio can be zero and the supply ratio can be K square root T. Okay. And now one refinement that some platforms have experimented with. So, I, so this is a screenshot from Uber. But I know Via did something similar. Is first come first serve. So before the day starts, maybe a couple of days in advance, let the drivers reserve slots. That's one of the pictures I showed earlier as well. And it really, what it does, it enables that a prior reservation. So that is one of the limitations of dynamic control. So that's a good feature, but still I would argue that SCFS is not necessarily prioritizing the drivers the way one should. And the way to see that in this figure is, let's say you're a full-time driver and you log into your app and see this figure, you might claim all the slots, 2 p.m., 5 p.m., 6 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m., but with a lot of gaps in your schedule, right? And that is bad for you in terms of your effective wage. Okay? Now, one can go ahead and formalize this intuition and show that wage ratio, before it was zero, now it's better, but it can still decay lin linearly in T, and recall T is the time horizon. So you can think of T as 24 hours. Right? And supply ratio can still be as bad as it was under DC, that's square root T. And again, coming back to my picture, really the limitation here is FCFS, even though it fixes the reso uh, prior reservation, it's not really prioritizing the drivers, right? And which results in a better wage ratio, but the supply ratio is still square root T. And even wage ratios decaying linearly in T, that, that can be quite bad. So what we propose, is a refinement of FCFS that essentially prioritizes the uh, drivers based on their types. Uh, to illustrate the mechanics, think of the simple figure on the x-axis, I have the time of day, and on the y-axis, I have that new unconstrained, new unconstrained, the demand I wanna fill. What I'll do first is I'll release the slots for the first time period. Okay, and let the driver sign up via first come first serve. That's the first time period. For the second time period, I, I'm proceeding sequentially. That's why sequential SCFS. I will first give priority to the drivers who are active in the first period. So I'm implicitly creating this priority. So if you're working in the previous period, you get priority over all of the drivers and release all the other slots to let the other driver sign up via first come first serve. In the third time period, now note that I have two set of drivers uh, who are all reactive. I'll again give them priority, but within this two set of drivers, I'll give priority to the drivers who wanna drive longer. So let's say the drivers at the bottom want to drive longer, they get priority first over the great drivers. All right, so that's the second key. And then again, I'll release the remaining slots uh, for the other drivers to fill up. Fourth time period, now, again, I'll give priority to the active drivers, but what ends up happening is you'll see that some of the drivers, especially the top grade drivers, it, this one driver actually couldn't get an allocation. There's just not enough demand. So what happens here is if that happens, that one extra driver, we call that it'll be purged. So essentially what that means is this driver we will not let this driver to participate in period five because she has already been turned off. And period five proceeds the same way with the priority rule, but now we also take care of the purge drivers. We don't let them sign up. Okay. So that's the mechanism, at least for the unimodal shape. And the nice thing about this allocation scheme is if, our dem if the demand is actually unimodal in the time, this allocation scheme is optimal in both dimensions. It achieves both the first best effective wage and the supply, right? You cannot do better than this. And uh, this is a result with probability one. It's not an expectation, right? Irrespective of how the order of the drivers unfolds, uh, you'll always achieve optimal, okay? And more realistically speaking, when the shape of the demand is bimodal with the morning and evening rush hours, what we can show is it still achieves the first best effective wage and it achieves at least half of the first best supply. 
And one can go ahead and tighten the half pound by one minus R by two, where R is roughly the excess supply you have between the two peaks. So R is always between zero and one. So as your excess supply between two peaks varies, this bond fluctuates between half and one, but in the worst case, it, it's at least half. Okay, now coming back to my picture, SFCFS, not just it enables a prior reservation, it also prioritizes the drivers based on their heterogeneous types. So really it gives a lot of prioritization to full-time drivers because they, those are the ones that are active initially and they want to drive long. And in terms of the performance metrics, it uh, from a weight ratio of two by T to two by square root P, it shoots up to one and a half in the worst case. So that's the uh, performance results we have analytically. In terms of the numerics, we calibrated our model to New York City data via a mix of sources. On the demand side, we estimated this bimodal shape. So roughly in the morning rush hour, let's say 9 a.m., the platform needs 18,000 drivers to be active, whereas in the evening rush hour, around 21,000 drivers to be active. And on the supply side, what we did is we estimated two distributions. The first distribution is as a driver, when you want to start your shift. And this was available in one of the TLC fact books. So TLC is the Taxi and Limousine Commission of New York City. Uh, they display this distribution. So let's say if I'm a driver, there's a 10% chance I start my shift around 7 a.m., right? And the second question I'm gonna ask is, okay, if I start my shift, how long do I wanna drive, right? That will give me the type. And that's coming from the report by Pattern Reach, again, from New York City data, is that the proportion of drivers and how long they wanna drive. So there's roughly 11% of the drivers who wanna drive for one hour a day and so on. So I'll assume the two distributions to be independent in my sampling. I don't have information on what the dependent structure is. And with these two distributions, I can sample the types of the drivers, right? And in terms of the number of drivers, I'll set to 60,000 with this sensitivity analysis here. And I'll set the hourly compensation to $20 an hour, and I'll play with the reservation wage of the drivers between zero and $20. So with this primitives, I can essentially simulate all the policies I've discussed so far. So that's what I did. For reservation wage, I did three settings, low, medium, high and have all my three policies for all the three reservation wages and my two metrics, supply ratio and wage ratio. Uh, in terms of supply ratios, this is all pre-COVID data. It's not surprising that it's just one for all the uh, policies. And that's really because pre-COVID there was an oversupply of drivers in these apps, right? But what we see is things actually matter in terms of the wage implications for drivers. So something like dynamic control can have a wage ratio as low as 75%, whereas SFCFS consistently achieves a wage ratio of one. And it's not just that SFCFS is consistent, it's that it's, it's robust to this notion of reservation wages. So irrespective of how desperate the drivers are, SFCFS is, is achieving a wage ratio of one, whereas if you see other metrics, if the drivers are have a high reservation wage, they might perform decent, but as soon as the drivers become more desperate, they start having bad wage implications. So that's what we did in terms of numerics. Uh, let me give another screenshot of the numerics. So in terms of, you can think for each R, how many extra drivers are coming on road, right? And what I did is for a low reservation wage, I simulated dynamic control, how many extra drivers end up being road in the equilibrium. And you can see that's a lot. So especially during these afternoon hours when there's a dip in demand, you can have up to 8,000 extra drivers on the road, right? And whereas SFCFS, it's essentially zero. There's no excess. Uh, so those are our key numerics. Uh, in terms of the insight, uh, we believe it's critical to let drivers communicate their preferences a priori and prioritize the drivers accordingly based on the heterogeneity and the communicated preferences. Uh, in terms of something uh, we believe that can be pursued further is this notion of welfare beyond one day. So this work really focused on a horizon of one day 
But if you think of a driver, they might care about, they probably care about the month over month income, right? So can you design markets where you have guarantees of that sort? Uh, I'll stop here, open the floor for questions and also let Philip uh, discuss the paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raghav. So uh, there is a question on the on the chat. I don't know if you can read the chat or if you want, I can read the question. I, I can read the chat, yes. So Ozan asked a question. Yes, Ozan asked. This is super interesting. Given the oversupply and undersupply can coexist in different parts of the city in practice, what are your thoughts on how to implement these policies when there is such spatial heterogeneity? It sounds like you did not account for this in the NYC application. This is correct. So Ozan, that's correct. We did not account for the spatial dimension in our model and uh, in the data analysis we have. And you're wondering within the city can have spatial. Ozan, are you thinking of these markets being completely disconnected mm -hmm. or do you think drivers can go from they can go I, from I, I, I'm really thinking about driver picking up a, a rider from a place where um, there's oversupply and going to joining sorry, the destinations in a different location where there's undersupply, right? So um, if it is the case that there are some regions with oversupply, other regions with undersupply, but the uh, the, the, the uh, movements of the riders or the demands of the riders effectively transfer the drivers from one location with oversupply to another with undersupply or vice versa. I'm trying to understand how um, this would impact um, some of the metrics that you focus on as well as the policy design um, questions. Right. That makes sense. I think that's a great question. So you're trying to essentially what you're doing is zoom in on the, even beyond the early dynamics, you're kind of zooming into the minute by minute dynamics or maybe at a five minute frequency that even though this, so our demand function is essentially at the early level. And this R, the platform that say needs 15,000 drivers to be active, but you're saying there might be some spatial imbalance within that R. Yeah, so if the city consists of 20 different zip codes, I'm thinking about 20 different demand functions as opposed to a single one. Right. So my intuition was that usually this demand so usually you will plan a bit ahead. So for example, this new unconstrained will be higher than the demand you're expecting, right? So just a simple example, if you're expecting demand of 10,000 uh, riders, you might have that, you might essentially plan for 13,000 drivers to be on road to capture that, uh, prior you can try to capture that, okay, I need some excess of drivers to be on road. That's one way of thinking about it. But I see like, if you really zoom into, if you really want to plan at the minute by minute level, you might have to opt to, you might have to go to your routing policies then. I think also maybe if you have, let's say a network, then the Lambda team UT relationship will also be a function of the demand imbalance patterns because you need to account for repositioning capacity or things like that. But, but yeah, that's, that's it. I, I'll shut up until this. Well, you shouldn't shut up, Philippe, because it's um, <laughs> your, your turn to discuss the paper. Okay, so, so I'll talk um, even more, okay. Yes, maybe we Great. can move to your discussion, thank you. Okay, uh, all right, let me just, okay, share my screen here. Okay, can you see that? Yes, yes, we can. All right. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Greetings from Toronto. Uh, a pleasure to discuss this paper. I also had interesting discussions with Raghav about the paper, which helped me in this discussion. So here we go. So the plan is uh, at a high level, I'll first do a little bit of replaying, but just highlighting a few things from my perspective. So hopefully this will be not redundant, but maybe help you uh, also get uh, some of the finer points of the paper again. Uh, and then I'll uh, give some general comments and then dive into some details of the policies. And then I have a bunch of 
comments, questions. I think there's lots of questions. Um, unclear how many of these one can answer, but this is just to stimulate um, the discussion. I'll be happy to share the slides uh, with the author. So I'm probably going to be quick, uh, not elaborate on each and every direction because I don't think there would be time for it. Um, okay, so here is kind of restating the problem. I just sort of, sort of thought, okay, what's the what's what's the problem here, right? The 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 starting point is drivers have low earnings. What is contributing to that? Uh, time varying demand is important, and so uh, as Raghav nicely showed, basically the time varying demand maps into a time varying sort of desired active supply, and then the question is, how do you? find drivers that you can allocate to this uh, desired active supply, right? And the problem is these people are independent, right? And they have heterogeneous preferences. And I think I was thinking, okay, so if we think of their entire time, right? Each one has an availability, oops. Each one has an availability window, right? A subset of that can be the on-road time. A subset of that can be their active time. And a subset of that is the actually serving writers, right? And, and in this paper, uh, uh, they're paid for not only being in service, but also active. And that was this nice discussion of, you know, the utilization adjusted effective wage, right? So in this paper, that's kind of already taken care of, right? Um, but all time is money to the drivers to some extent. So where the inefficiency for drivers comes from is non-active time also costs them for this, right? Whether it's on road or maybe even if they're available and you know they just committed to less on road time because they weren't hoping to actually make money, right? So then there's this important tension. The platform's primary focus is to meet its desired active supply and it doesn't directly care immediately so for on road supply, right? Uh, but uh, because of various frictions, um, the desired active supply may correspond to excess on-road supply and that makes the drivers unhappy. So there's some tension and the paper nicely studies this question, right? How can we sort of balance these two potentially conflicting objectives, right? Um, a few things just before, you know, I just thought I would summarize these things to also kind of position the paper from my perspective, right? So single location that relates to uh, Ozan's question, multiple time periods with time varying demand, um, fixed financials and the strategic drivers uh, have private information about their preferences in this paper they're heterogeneous in terms of their availability window right they're otherwise identical i mean it's 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 elaborate enough as it is they have the same reservation wage right and as i said earlier the drivers are paid for active time uh, but they are somehow required to uh, have a contiguous on-road time, right? And so this paper is kind of uh, not concerned with the service utilization, right? That's kind of abstracted away from the paper. There's some other papers that dig into this um, and see what are some of these implications, right? Um, well, because the financials are fixed, the focus is on operational controls, right? Uh, and the focus is on operational performance metrics, and if you, if I sort of restate, um, you know, these two ratios, so for the platform, the supply ratio is uh, total active supply over total first best supply. If you go through the paper, you realize that the total first best supply is essentially a derived problem input, right? You have the problem parameters, you can characterize the total first best supply, and then this is kind of fixed in the picture, right? Uh, the platform wants to maximize the total active supply, right? The total, the, the driver's wage, wage ratio can be stated as follows. And so the goal is twofold for the platform, maximize the active uh, supply. And then for the drivers, whatever active supply, try to achieve that with the smallest amount of total on-road supply, right? And the challenge is, uh, along with private information and 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 you know conflicting uh, drivers competing, right? It basically gives rise to externalities both within a time slot, right? If we all want the same time slot and only some of them can get it, and then across time slots, if there's gaps, uh, and then in terms of the analysis, the focus is on worst case performance guarantees, uh, so to speak, over all possible markets, right? So in terms of positioning and contributions, I'll focus here just on how this 
you know, because you, you might think, wow, there's so many papers, right? So I think, um, you know, the red things jointly, I think, are the distinctive features uh, of the paper, right? Time bearing demand, dual focus on these two objectives, and explicit considerations of drivers having uh, perform uh, temporal preferences over the course of a day. Um, so the drivers basically decide when to work, which is a combination of on-road time, but then depending on the mechanism, they essentially can also have an influence on what is the active time they end up with, right? If you want to contrast this with other single location models with strategic drivers, there the primary decision is, should I work or not? Some papers also think of how much to work, depending on heterogeneous uh, opportunity costs. And then there's some nice papers that look at heterogeneous job types. So then it's like, which job should I accept, right? So here it's kind of more, which time slots should I go for, right? And of course, if you have multi-location models, repositioning decisions come, come into play potentially, right? So the contributions, I think the, the model has some nice novelty. Uh, it gives you performance guarantees on uh, on some you know plausible existing policies and also sheds light on the insights. Uh, it sheds insights on the sources of these losses. Uh, and the new mechanism uh, turned is you know sort of a, a clever algorithm that uh, they label sequential first come first serves gives optimality for the drivers. Uh, and some performance guarantee for the platform, you might recall this one minus R over two. Um, and then there's also some nice numerical study, which is very carefully done to just kind of illustrate the insights. Um, some general comments. Uh, so I think it's an important issue. It's been underexplored. I mean, like everything, there's some work on some aspects, but I think there's still interesting things to be said. And I think this paper says interesting things about it. Um, it's very well written, uh, you know, a clever model, clean results. Um, nice insightful numerical industry illustrations. Largely, it's very clear exposition. I discussed with Raghav some things that I think one might clarify. I'm not gonna bore you with these. Uh, and then I think one can also expand and sharpen some of the compare and contrast with some re related literature streams. So for example, you know, what if it's, uh, you know, let's say a call center platform where you have agents that choose their schedule, right? Um, to what extent does this model, apply in some sense. There's also some loosely related work uh, in sort of self-scheduling capacity. Uh, I don't think they do the same thing, but I think the paper could be further strengthened by further clarifying these dif differences. Um, and then there's, I think, potential for more research, even though what's been done here, I think is, is already quite nice. Um, so before I go to some high level ideas, uh, just to recap the policies, I'm just going to focus on the red stuff here, right? So basically the dynamic control policy is, is allocating active time. I mean, first of all, the big problem is that people commit to on road time, which is costly upfront, right? Once that's done, right, then it's kind of a time by time period lottery, right? And the problem is that this upfront payment of the reservation wage, you have to do that with an uncertain lottery outcome, right? And so there's sort of two things that can go wrong is one is, um, <clears throat> you know, you have a low profit expected profit in, in one period. Um, and then the other thing is that might scare you away from even being on road in certain periods, which, which harms the platform, right? First come first serve is, um, you know, is allowing people to reserve. But the key thing uh, which Raghav highlighted is that this priority is independent of the type and in particular the availability profile, right? Um, so the nice thing is that once I choose my on-road time, I know I will be allocated um, um, capacity with probability one. Um, but, uh, you know, the problem is that the sequence of who gets first access is random. And so the part-time drivers, if they get high priority, might impose externalities on full-time drivers. And then there's this uh, clever modification uh, in, in the form of the sequential first come first served. Um, you know, I won't go through all these things. I think the key thing is that there's this slicing up into unimodal slices. Um, within each slice, the, the mechanism achieves a contiguous active time. 
And then the assumption is that uh, the drivers eliminate non-contiguous on-road time at the very end. And this is how they achieve a wage ratio of one, right? So if you try to sort of express this, I think it's like a sequential allocation of active time period by period and driver by driver. But the priority policy is really type or state dependent, right? So two questions here. One is might say, well, why can't you just from the outset allocate priorities in some sense, higher rank to longer availabilities? And you know, the answer is I think it's complicated. <laughs> and basically this clever mechanism achieves that in the end. And then uh, a question to the authors. I also talked with this uh, about this with Ragal. I think it would be nice to somehow reflect the priority feature in the name of the algorithm. I'm not sure it completely reflects. And I'm not saying it's easy to reflect what it's doing, but I think maybe that's just a suggestion, right? Um, a couple of observations on the performance guarantees, right? So these are by nature worst case guarantees, right? And so just to sort of uh, so I think in some sense, they end up being quite pessimistic. So if you look at the, the DC wage ratio, which is zero, this is achieved if the number of drivers goes to infinity and the reservation wage goes to zero. And even in a single period, basically, you know, people will all participate, pay the on time, uh, the, the, the on road time. Uh, and, and then, you know, the, the probability that they actually get it is, is, is vanishingly small, right? Uh, the DC wage ratio of two over T is also extreme in the sense that if you look at the proof, it's one driver and there's only supply in the first and last period, right? So it can get as bad as that, right? A more nuanced thing is if you notice the supply ratio of the DC and first come first serve are the same. And this is basically achieved by letting for the, for the F, FCFS proof you know, take one full-time driver and let the number of part-time drivers go to infinity. So the probability that the part-time driver gets goes goes last goes basically to, to one, right? Uh, and then there's a minor nuance. Uh, I'll skip that, uh, you know, in terms of apples to apples comparisons, right? So some comments and questions. I think I'm almost out of time, although we started two minutes late. Um, I'll just give you the high levels and then I'll share the details with Raka. So I think in terms of performance metrics, Simple observation, right? The supply ratio is actually not, ne not necessarily equal to the profit ratio because the prices are time varying, <clears throat> right? Um, the wage ratio, um, you know, there's all kinds of questions whether other metrics might make sense for the drivers. <clears throat> um, in terms of the performance guarantees, as I pointed out earlier, some of these are excessively pessimistic. I know it's hard if you sort of restrict things, but are there any interesting conditional performance guarantees, conditional on financial parameters, demand supply imbalance, or some characteristics of the driver mix or their temporal characteristics? In terms of model primitives, you know, I'm not sure whether anything can be said about heterogeneous reservation wages. Um, you know, then there's also a big buzzword about autonomous vehicles and the whole employees versus contractors question. How would that affect maybe um, some of these uh, thoughts? Um, then optimal mechanism in general, and then money is kind of missing. Uh, I mean, missing, you have to fix some things, otherwise it becomes a big mess. But still, there's a question of what is the interplay between financial and operational controls. I also see some potentially loose connections to multi-unit reverse auctions with externalities, which is in some sense what you have here. Uh, except that there it would be like, um, you know, spatial, like I'm, I'm thinking frequency auctions or something like that. Uh, Ozan mentioned spatial considerations. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent unpredictable variability could be uh, adapted in the mechanisms. And then Rakav mentioned the longer, longer term perspective. So I'll shut up here. Thank you, Philippe uh, and Raghav, both of you. Um, let's see, we, we are kind of right at that point where we might take one question, uh, maybe one quick question if everybody wants to, and, and maybe we give time to Ilan to um, start um, sharing screen. So um, any questions for Raghav? Okay, I don't see any questions then. Um, remember, after the session, we can go back to the virtual venue and then we can continue um, the discussion and you can interact more with the speaker and the discussion. So thank you both. Uh, and now we move to our second 
uh, paper. Um, so we are pleased to have Ilan uh, Morgenstern, um, who is going to be uh, presenting his work on information disclosure and promotion policy. So Ilan, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rene. Uh, and thank you, Rene Osan and, and Rad, for organizing the conference and for the opportunity to, to present our work here. Uh, thanks also, Chris, for, for reading our paper and preparing the discussion. Um, so yeah, let me start. Uh, my name is Ilan Morgenstern. I'm a PhD student at Stanford GSB, and uh, today I'm going to talk about joint work with uh, Yoni Gur, Greg McNamara, and Daniela Saban. Uh, Yoni and Daniela are uh, professors at the operations group at Stanford GSB, and Greg is a researcher at Facebook. Um, so the talk today is going to be about uh, online, uh, you know, retail marketplaces or platforms. And specifically about promotion policies in this marketplace and I'll, I'll describe in detail what do I mean by this but as an example for the rest of the talk you can keep in mind this screenshot I have here from Amazon so suppose you're going on Amazon you want to buy this uh, Lego spaceship and oh in, I guess a, a good number of consumers when, when considering to buy this they would look at this product look at the price it's 109.99 and then decide whether you want to buy it or not by clicking either add to cart or buy now or just closing the page or going to somewhere else. However, there is also uh, that there are there are more than one seller in Amazon selling this product or a very similar product. And uh, many people don't realize, but if you scroll down the page, there is a section here that I'm highlighting on green that is called other sellers on Amazon. So here we have three other sellers besides the main seller that are selling essentially the same product. It can be a bit different because it can be used uh, or, or it can also be new, uh, but they're selling you know, a very similar product. Uh, the sellers might be different in terms of their ratings, their delivery speeds, uh, uh, but, but overall it's a, a very comparable option. So you have here an option to buy from, from other sellers, right? For, for a slightly higher price, sometimes this price is even lower. Um, now, the, the main question of the paper is Amazon has these four sellers here, and it has to choose one of the sellers to allocate uh, what we call the buy box. So the red space, the, the space that I'm highlighting in red over here. So of these four sellers, how does Amazon choose which of the sellers gets the transaction when the user clicks uh, on the buy box? Uh, now, we don't know, uh, oh, sorry, we don't know actually that, that much about this algorithm. If you go to Amazon's uh, website for sellers, this, this algorithm is called the Featured Merchant Algorithm. And then, you know, they just say, you know, we want to give customers the best shopping experience um, using this algorithm. So in order to be eligible for the buy box, you as a seller need to satisfy a number of requirements related to, you know, on-time delivery, uh, seller rating. Uh, and crucially, they don't really say how much is it worth to be on the buy box, right? Intuitively, of course, we expect more transactions to go through the buy box than through other sellers on Amazon section. But they are just saying, you know, for many sellers, being the featured offer can lead to increased sales. That's just all the information that they are kind of giving. Uh, now, how are we going to, to capture this in the model, the benefit of being uh, in the buy box versus not being in the buy box as a seller? We're going to assume there are two types of, of consumers that I'm going to call patient and impatient. Uh, impatient consumers, they are going to just consider buying either from the buy box or not buying at all. So they will never go and spend the time browsing on the other sellers on Amazon search. On the other hand, we're going to assume that a fraction of consumers are patient and they will look at all the options that are available, right? Uh, given this kind of framework and this example I'm giving, the, the, the main question of the paper is going to be, how should Amazon design the promotion policy? So who to allocate the buy box to, which of the sellers? And moreover, what information should Amazon or the platform disclose to sellers about the value of being promoted? So for example, should the plat should Amazon promote the seller with the lowest price always, or, or is there some other consideration uh, that you should keep in mind? And you know, to what extent it should disclose the impact of being in the buy box to seller. So it's a bit very different to live in a world where Amazon would tell to sellers, you know, 90% of sales actually go through the buy box. So you, you better be there if you want to sell versus a world where you know only 50% of, of transactions go, go through the buy box. So 
uh, this is kind of the, the flavor of, of, the, of the model we're going to, to be studying and the paper and, and the, the questions. So a bit more formally, uh, our main research question is going to be, how can a platform design a joint information disclosure and promotion policy to maximize consumer surplus? In the setting I just uh, described at a high level. Okay. We're going to have a dynamic model uh, that you know it, it can capture some complicated dynamics because the, the information and the pro promotion and pricing interact uh, a long time. So you know the seller's posted price will impact whether the seller gets promoted or not. The promotion decision will impact the seller's information about the proportion of patient versus inpatient consumers and the true state of the world. And that information will then determine their, their subsequent prices. So all of these factors are, are interplaying in, in a dynamic way. Uh, but uh, we will show that with the model we have, we can, we can do two, two main things. One is to characterize uh, the maximum achievable uh, long run average consumer surplus in the system. And moreover, we uh, identify uh, practical policies that achieve this, this welfare uh, in an equilibrium. I'll describe this in, in a more detail later. Uh, but essentially, we're characterizing the maximum payoff that the platform can generate and what are specific policies that allow the platform to, to achieve this, this welfare. This is the overview of, of the talk today. Um, great. So let me start describing now the model. So the model is going to have three components. Uh, first, we're going to have consumers, which are you know, the people coming to the, the platform and deciding whether to buy products or not. As I was prefacing, consumers will be heterogeneous in their type, which determines in, so intuitively their consideration set. So we're going to have patient consumers that consider all the products available in the platform. And on the other hand, we will have impatient consumers that only consider the promoted product or not to purchase at all. There's going to be a fraction uh, that we denote by fee that denotes how many, what, what fraction of consumers are, are impatient. And this fraction can be either low or high. Okay, these low and high values are, are primitives. Uh, Moreover, the, the consumer's choice, given her type and the, the platform's uh, decision and the, the seller's price, uh, is going to be encoded in a choice model, right? The demand function that, that will capture this, uh, you know, the, their preferences for, for the product. Okay. The second key component is a platform. The platform is essentially looking at this. The, the actions of, of the seller and then given the information they have on the consumer deciding whether to promote the seller or not. Okay. So we're going to adopt an information design or uh, patient persuasion framework for this. At the beginning of, of the model, the platform is going to commit to the joint uh, policy. The policy, the joint policy composed is composed of an information disclosure policy. So a signal that the cell that the platform gives seller uh, on the state of the world. And the promotion policy is going to be essentially intuitively the, the algorithm that the platform uses to decide which seller to promote. Okay. Uh, then the, the platform is going to observe the true state of the world and send a signal to the seller. And then on every period, we are going to assume that the platform is uh, that, that, that the platform payoff is consumer welfare, which is captured by a function that we denote by by W. So in our model, the, the platform is essentially looking after the consumer with it. If you were to maximize revenue, things could be different. But in our model, we're taking the view that uh, the platform is kind of playing the long run game and trying to maximize consumer welfare. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't have clicked there. All right, back to the slide I want. Um, the third component, now that I described the consumers and the platform, is uh, the seller. So for simplicity, now we're going to assume there is only one seller. I'll describe the case with more sellers later on in the talk. But there is a single seller that does not know the fraction fee of impatient consumers. And at the beginning of every period, the seller is going to update its belief on the state of the world based on the information that it has observed and set a price for the product on that period. Okay. The, as we're focusing on one seller only, the platform's decision is going to be, do I promote the seller only or do I not promote anyone at all? And not promoting anyone at all, you can interpret it as there is some other fixed option that the platform can promote instead of, instead of the, the seller that is moving the price. 
Okay. Let me describe it in the timeline in, in a bit more detail. Uh, so the platform, uh, as I was mentioning, is going to commit to two objects, the information disclosure policy and the plat uh, promotion policy. So the, the information disclosure um, policy is going to be a signaling mechanism. So a signaling mechanism that maps the state of the world that can be low or high to a distribution over a set of possible signals. Later on, we simplify this set of possible signals to be also low or high as, as in the traditional Bayesian persuasion uh, literature. And the second component is the dynamic promotion policy, which is a sequence of functions, alpha t, where each of the functions, uh, is a, it, it gives me, given the seller's price, the true state of the world, and potentially all the history up to time t, what is the probability that the platform promotes the seller in that period? Okay, and promoting here means allocating the buy box intuitively. Just to make the, the previous uh, timeline that I described a bit more clear, on the first period, the platform is first going to commit to these policies, then observe the fraction uh, fee, the true, the, whether it's a, a low or high, and then send the signal uh, to the seller on, on this, on this uh, observation. And then essentially the, the, the game between the seller and the platform starts. So after the first period, every period looks as follows. The seller first updates its belief based on the information it has gathered. Based on that information, it sets a price. Given the price, the platform makes a promotion decision using the policies that it has chosen. And then once the, the, the price and the promotion decisions are set, the consumer arrives to the website. It can be you know, impatient or patient and based on their type and their preferences makes a purchase decisions and we move on to the next period, okay? For the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to assume that the seller is pricing myopically. So that the seller is pricing on every period to maximize the current uh, revenue for the period for this consumer and not taking into account you know, future um, uh, forward-looking considerations. Uh, this is in line with some of the literature that I'll discuss in more detail. And, but the, later on, we'll, uh, we'll relax this. I'll, I'll talk about the result of what happens if we relax it, if I, if I have time. Okay, um, so before we start with the results, the, the platform's objective is going to be to maximize the average uh, expected consumer welfare. So essentially how to design the promotion policy and the signaling mechanism to make consumers as good off as possible given the seller that is pricing myopic. Okay. And this will all be a function of mu zero, which is a common prior for the seller and the platform on the event that the fraction of impatient consumers is high. Okay, let me, um, maybe before I discuss the literature, let me stop here in case there are any questions. So, okay, it's a bit of, of a handful to describe this more. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let me move on. Uh, so I will get uh, enough time to discuss the literature, but briefly we are, I think this paper is related to, I guess, primarily to the dynamic pricing and learning literature and the information design literature. Uh, and information design in, in operations has been an, I guess, a very active area in the past maybe 10 years. And in the room, we have a Chris and co-authors that have done uh, very nice papers about it. Also, Osan has done, done important work. In pricing, we you know, have a lot, of, a lot of work also in operations that the people in this room have, have done. Um, so yeah, sorry if I'm missing any of your work, but yeah, it's a big literature. Okay. Uh, having said this, let me move on to describe the main results and, and our analysis of, of the model. So remember that I'm, I'm assuming now that the seller is pricing myopically on every period, right? So one question to say is, okay, this is a complicated dynamic problem. What happens if we have the platform acting myopically also? So, you know, choose some signaling mechanism and then thereafter choose the promotion policy that maximizes every period uh, consumer welfare. Okay, so let's think about what happens in this case. One option would be for the platform to reveal full information. So we tell the seller, hey, the true state of the world is high when it's high and it's slow. You know, if the seller state is low, tell, tell the seller it's low. And then choose a myopically optimal promotion. If that were the case, we get a payoff that looks like this straight line here, this blue line here, where in the x-axis I have the prior on uh, the, the the value of fee being uh, high, so the, the proportion of impatient consumer being high. 
Now, another option would be just to give the seller no information at all. Just don't tell, don't tell the seller anything. And then optimize, you know, choose a myopically optimal policy in in our period. So if the game was a single shot game, we would get a payoff like this, like what I'm showing here. And this is a specific example. Yeah, but in the in the example I'm plotting, concealing information can be valuable. So if we don't give the seller any information and we then choose a myopically optimal policy, this in, in this example it's better than truthful revelation. Okay, so there is some value to, to conceal information. However, since our model is dynamic, what is going to happen as we increase the time horizon? The seller is going to start learning from the sales observation. So if we increase the time horizon to 500, we see the average uh, consumer surplus per period, per period decreasing. We go to 1,000 and decrease further. And then as you, as you can expect, eventually uh, asymptotically, this becomes equivalent to the blue line to full information. So if we if we myopically optimize this under some conditions, uh, gives the seller enough information about the state of the world that the welfare you, the platform generates converges to the maximum it can do under truthful revelation. So if we are not careful with the information with the information revelation uh, in a dynamic way, we can lose uh, the, or the platform can lose any benefits it can initially generate from you know playing with, with the information for the seller. So having said this, what can the platform do? Can the platform uh, choose the policy in a way that it prevents the seller from learning based on sales observations? And what we show is yes, it, it can do it, but it can be costly. Why it can be costly? Because essentially we are adding one more constraint to our optimization problem intuitively. So later, before I'm, I'm hiding all the math you know, from, from the argument, but I was maximize you know, the myopically optimal promotion is maximize welfare for the current period. And now I'm going to add another constraint that essentially says maximize current welfare subject to the seller's belief in this period should be the same as in the next period. And then, you know, this adds another constraint to, to the incentives that we can uh, induce for the seller to set a, a lower price. Okay. However, when we, we, we are now going to focus on this class of promotion policies that we call confounding promotion policies. And this class are those that prevent the seller from learning any information about the state of the world after the initial signal. So essentially, these are the policies that induce the seller's belief mu t to be equal to mu one, the seller's belief in the first period uh, with probability one. Now let's consider what happens if we look at the maximum achievable welfare for confounding policies. And this I'm going to define the denote by WC here. And uh, essentially you can think of this as the optimization problem I described, maximize welfare subject to this constraint satisfying, being satisfied at all points of time. Okay, so given all this, our main result is that this is in some sense optimal. This class of policies is, is, is optimal in a sense. So the, the maximum long run average welfare when with a myopic seller, which is the left hand side here, uh, is equal or the, the best the platform can do is the concavification of this function here of the maximum welfare achievable by a confounding policies. Okay, I'll describe it, this intuition in a bit more detail. Uh, if, if you don't recall what the concavification is, if you take if you take this function WC, the concavification of WC is the smallest function that is above WC, but that it's concave. Yeah. Okay, so let me give an idea of, of the proof in, in, in a bit more detail. So essentially what, what we have is that, what, what, what one can show is that when sales observations are informative about fee, the, the sorry if there are periods where we go where we the platform captures a welfare that is higher than this concavification of of wc then the sales information are informative why because the constraint that i described earlier is being violated and then that that allows the seller to update the belief in some extent next step we use a result very similar to a paper by uh, harrison keskin and, and zevi that shows that the beliefs of the seller converge to the truth exponentially fast in the number of periods where these uh, sales observations become informative. 
And from this, we conclude intuitively that the platform can only generate more than the concavification uh, payoff finitely often. Then, you know, I'm hiding a lot of math here, but this allows us to compare that the long run average is at most this concavification. And finally, we construct a policy that achieves this, uh, this concavification. How do we do this? We construct the optimal confounding policy that achieves uh, the, the WC payoff. Uh, I'm, I'm hiding the details of that here, but one nice thing that we can do, we do in, in the proof is that we can reduce this functional optimization problem to a single uh, three, uh, static optimization problem in only three variables. Uh, it requires like a few lemmas, but, but it's, it, it can be simplified uh, quite nicely to that. And then to reach the concavification, we simply adopt the, the standard the Bayesian persuasion algorithm uh, originally due to Kamenikan. So how does this look in the in the previous chart that I was showing? Well, I told you if if we if the game was a one shot game, we could achieve this red line over here. But as you start as the seller start laning, the red line starts to shrink towards the blue line. But if we uh, choose our optimal confounding policy, we can achieve something like this black line over here. So we we still won't get to the one shot red line uh, because we are. Uh, incurring in some short run costs by adding this constraint of no learning to the optimization problem. This weakens the seller's incentive to set a lower price. Uh, but we are still capturing a long run game that prevents the seller from learning. So we are able to capture essentially this, you know, this, this blue uh, gap here uh, over, the, over the truthful revelation uh, benchmark. Okay. Okay, so this is the main result of the paper. Now I'll I'll describe some additional results and, and extensions in I have like six minutes in a, in a bit in a bit of without, without too much detail. Um, so one key thing that I that I have focused now in, in, in the model or one one key assumption is that we have a single seller. But of course, in these platforms, you know, there are more than one seller usually. Uh, so we have an extension of the of the model to having two sellers that have that are competing in prices in every period and under the setting we compare a triple we, we want to try to understand is confounding still valuable when we model many sellers interacting two sellers so to this end we compare a, the truthful revelation benchmark with two policies one is one where you confound both of the sellers so don't allow either seller to learn and one is the confound one seller only so choose one seller and confound that seller and what we what we find is that Confounding both sellers is actually usually suboptimal. Usually, it's better just to go with truthful revelation. But if we are careful with what seller do we confound, this can often dominate truthful revelation. So choose one seller to confound, let the other seller learn. This can be better than the truthful revelation. Now, this begs the question: which, which of the sellers should you confound as a platform? And what we show in in, in a stylized setting that we have is that you should confound the seller with a relatively higher demand. So in this chart here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm having two sellers with you know, some linear demand model that is parameterized by A and B. And then what, what this, this charts are saying is if seller, if A is larger than B, where A is the parameter, demand parameter for seller A, you should um, confound seller one and let seller two simply learn. Uh, okay, so some other results that we have, uh, going back to the to the baseline formulation, uh, and another assumption that we made is myopic pricing, right? So that the seller is pricing to maximize the current uh, payoff only on every period. But uh, what we show is that even if the seller were, you know, playing a, 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 a you know, kind of a Bayesian game with the platform and, and looking at the continuation payoff. We, there exists equilibria in which the, the, the policies that we described are, you know, there exists an equilibria with the policies that we described. Uh, I won't get into the details of this because it requires, you know, some definitions of equilibria and some refinements, but we can, uh, we can show also that the equilibrium we, we construct based on our optimal confounding policy is actually optimal for the platform within a class of equilibria that, that, we, that we define on the paper. Okay. So some more extensions. Uh, well, the competition one I already I already briefly discussed, but with two sellers, we show that it's often often optimal to confound one of them, but usually not both of them. One other uh, result that we have is with
Well, it looks like we lost the speaker. Um, I know they have some issues at Stanford with their internet, and so this might be the reason. I was mentioning that before the start of the session. So um, let's see if... Um, I was discussing extensions. Um, yeah. We know that do very well, but it requires a more complicated policy than the static policy that we show, that we use for, for the, the other. Let me conclude here just to make sure I, I go to the end and I leave time for, for Chris. Uh, but yeah, uh, just to conclude, we, we, what we have in the paper, it's a model that uh, integrates information disclosure and promotion policy design for, for online platforms. And it first, uh, sellers learning and pricing to what they learn when the demand structure is endogenously uh, given by the actions and, and choices of the platform. In terms of policy in this thing, uh, and the managerial implications, we have a uh, kind of tip to uh, construct optimal policies given you know the demand structure and the impact. Uh, sorry about that, but yeah, I'll, I'll just end. Uh, about yes, that. Ilan, we uh, we were thinking we are thinking that your connection is very unstable, so maybe we should move to Chris' discussion. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, and I apologize for for this. Okay, uh, are you all able to hear me as well as uh, see my slides? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the conference organizers for putting together a great program. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, discuss this very interesting uh, paper. Um, so uh, I'm Krishna Murthy Iyer from the University of Minnesota. Uh, so what I want to structure this discussion about is like, I'll start by just describing the problem and uh, give my interpretation of the results that uh, doctors have uh, obtained and uh, gives me intuition behind the results. And uh, we'll, I'll end with a few que questions and comments uh, at the end. And uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, as uh, Ilan mentioned, uh, the problem that uh, uh, in many of these uh, platforms, so specifically Amazon here, uh, he had this image of like, uh, 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 Promo seller promotions where one of the seller is put into this buy box while all other sellers are sort of relegated to the end of the page, uh, some, somewhat far off from the, uh, from the buy box. So one of the seller gets a prominent placement. And I, from, my, from what I understand, the, uh, the main focus of this paper is to understand how platforms can effectively promote sellers. Uh, without leading to excessive surplus extraction by the sellers, right? And why would uh, there be a surplus extraction by the sellers? So any seller that gets put into the buy box essentially uh, has a, a more prominent placement, has fewer competition and sees a greater demand. A lot of the uh, people just buy from the buy box uh, and don't even look at the other sellers. So this would induce them due to reduced uh, competition to increase prices. And that's probably, that's uh, bad for the uh, consumers, the buyers, right? So this is the goal of this paper. And uh, the paper, uh, in order to study this, uh, I'll just briefly list of the main contributions. So the paper comes up with a, uh, the authors have come up with a, a, a two-sided market model. Uh, so this is a modeling contribution uh, with a strategic seller heterogeneous buyers and there is informational asymmetry between the platform and the seller, right? And as someone who has uh, looked at models like these, uh, dynamic models like these, uh, I understand like how difficult it is to often say anything non-trivial in, in such a complex model. Uh, uh, and to the author's credit, uh, they have actually uh, uh, come up with a very simplified approach to designing optimal promotion policies uh, for the platform to promote sellers. Uh, that maximize long run consumer surplus, right? And to do this, they essentially uh, figured out a way to carefully control the information that is uh, leaked from the platform by the seller during these promotions, right? 
And as I'll mention briefly, uh, uh, the main technical tools here are this notion of confounding policies and uh, essentially using information design to simplify the problem. So uh, what I want to do first is to briefly describe the main model that uh, the uh, authors have uh, developed, right? And give a brief uh, intuition behind the results and discuss some of the challenges here. Uh, so uh, so the, the, the uh, I mean, as Elon mentioned, they look at various extensions, but the very uh, central model here is of a two-sided market uh, with a platform, one strategic seller, and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, heterogeneous buyers, right? And the assumption here is that the seller sets prices dynamically uh, based on what they learn over time about the demand. And uh, uh, for now, we'll assume that these prices are set myopically, although the authors uh, uh, perform an equilibrium analysis and pro uh, show that uh, the myopic pricing can be sustained in equilibrium. So, uh, so at each time, whenever a buyer comes, the platform promotes one seller. Uh, this seller is put into the buy box, as uh, Ilan mentioned. And uh, the buyer can be of two types, an impatient, impatient buyer who just buys directly from the promoted seller, directly from the buy box, versus a patient buyer who considers a larger set of sellers on the platform. Right? And the underlying assumption here is that the platform knows the fraction of impatient buyers, perhaps from extensive data collection, but the seller, uh, 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 seller does not. Seller uh, can learn over time, but initially they don't know the exact fraction of impatient buyers. So the so platform has more accurate demand information, seller does not have demand information. And for simplicity, the assumption here is that this fraction can take one of two values, a low fraction of impatient buyers or a high fraction of impatient buyers. And there is a common prior about, uh, about this uh, unknown fraction, right? So, uh, uh, so essentially what's going on is that the platform observes this demand information fee, right? And then decides based on this fee, uh, whether to promote a seller or not, right? So it makes this promotion decision. And both the demand uh, information, the fraction of impatient buyers and the promotion decision together affect the sales outcome, right? And uh, the assumption is that, the, is that the, while the seller can see whether there was a sale or not in the, uh, on the platform, they uh, cannot keep track of whether they were promoted uh, or not. So they don't see the promotion decision, but they see the sales outcome. So uh, from this, we can intuitively see that the sales data uh, leaks information about the demand information fee to the seller, right? And as they learn this demand information, uh, the seller can then update, uh, having better information can update the prices adversely, right? So the platform's problem is how to design this promotion policy, the choosing these promotion decisions based on the demand information to maximize long run consumer surplus. So this is the problem. So I want to describe first the challenges in understanding, like studying this uh, uh, problem, uh, it, uh, right? And to do this, I'll just use a little bit of uh, 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 pictorially. So I have, uh, so one can imagine that the seller has some belief about the fraction of impatient uh, buyers, and I have shown this on the y-axis from zero to one. And the uh, uh, promotion period can be thought of as an horizon. And uh, I've listed it as like an infinite horizon, but uh, uh, it doesn't really matter. You can also consider finite horizons, right? And uh, the seller starts with some initial uh, prior belief about what the fraction of uh, impatient buyers are, right? And as the uh, seller uh, does these promotions, uh, the, uh, so the platform does these promotions, the seller gets more sales data, right? And they update their beliefs about uh, the fraction of uh, 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 impatient buyers, right? And here I've drawn two trajectories, one corresponding to when the fraction of in, uh, impatient buyers is large, the other corresponding to when the fraction of impatient buyers is small, right? But at the end of the day, because we know that beliefs are martingales, these will converge to some point, right? And uh, since the platform cares about long-run consumer surplus, 
the point that it would converge to will correspond to some consumer surplus. So we can think of a consumer surplus as some function over the eventual beliefs, right? So from this, we can see that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the platform's goal is to maximize this expected consumer surplus that arises in the long run, right? So in order to do that, the platform has to consider how its promotion affects this uh, evolution of the seller's beliefs corresponding to different uh, trajectories, right? And one can see immediately that this is a very challenging problem because the sellers believe, seller learns from the sales data. So their beliefs gets updated, uh, that affects the prices. And then the, uh, the platform's promotion decisions have to take these uh, evolution of beliefs into account to come up with optimal uh, uh, promotion, promotion policies, right? So uh, uh, to, the, to the author's credits, in fact, in the appendix, the authors actually characterize this problem and provide an equilibrium, uh, uh, provide an optimal promotion policies that does this, right? But uh, the main uh, point of this paper, in my opinion, is that you don't really actually need to do all this uh, complicated analysis. You can actually simplify the problem significantly, right? And that to do this, the authors uh, basically have uh, uh, the main insight of this paper is that the, uh, this whole problem can be decoupled into two uh, separate components. One is to control how much information is leaked from the platform to the seller and the promotion decisions. And these could be uh, decoupled using confounding and signaling, right? Uh, so what's the main idea behind confounding? Uh, the main idea here is that, uh, so the platform decides these promotion policies uh, based on the demand information and uh, the, con the platform could choose a confounding policy such that they can do promotions in such a way that the sales outcome essentially becomes independent of the demand information, the fraction of uh, impatient bias. So what this would require is that if the fraction of impatient bias is low, the platform should promote the seller more often. If the fraction of impatient buyers is high, the platform should promote the seller less often, right? Just so that from the seller's perspective, the sale does not contain any information about the demand, uh, demand the fraction of impatient buyers, right? So once that happens, all this complicated trajectory evolution of the seller's belief can, once the platform uses a confounding policy, what this means is that the platform does not learn anything about the uh, fraction demand, right? And their belief remains uh, constant, right? Now, this might not be good because maybe the initial belief of the seller is really bad, right? So what in, what, in addition to sort of do the optimal promotion, what the seller platform should be doing is to do some information design to initialize the beliefs correctly, right? So the, in the beginning, the platform sends a signal to the uh, seller, maybe giving some information about the demand, but after that, the, uh, the platform uses a confounding policy to keep the beliefs constant, right? And from this figure, you can see that as long as you care about the eventual beliefs, the long run beliefs, it, uh, any trajectory that will be formed uh, by this can be achieved by uh, uh, initial signaling and a confounding policy, right? So this is the main idea, right? So a benefit, uh, there are many benefits for taking this kind of an approach, like separating these uh, uh, two, uh, two aspects. So the confounding policy, one thing is that it is independent of the seller's belief, right? And uh, so the seller's belief does not really play a role in the construction of the confounding policy. It plays a role in the design of the initial signals, right? Uh, another thing is that the dynamics of the problem vanishes, right? So it just becomes a static information design problem and a single period promotion uh, decision problem because the beliefs are all static, right? So that, uh, that simplifies the problem significantly. And from a practical perspective, the initial signals can be naturally implemented as a price recommendation by the platform to the, uh, uh, to the seller, right? Uh, so in the interest of time, let me not talk about the extensions, but as uh, Ilan mentioned, there have been, uh, they look at like multiple sellers and so on. So let me quickly end with uh, 
talking about some merits and broader insight and some questions, right? So I think that this is a very innovative use of information design to simplify operational decisions. So information design, the problem is about promotion, say seller promotion, but you can use information design to simplify that promotion decision. So this is, uh, this is similar to other papers like Ashlagi, uh, Monachu and Nixad who do resource allocation uh, problems and they look at uh, using information design to simplify the design of those settings. Uh, but the broader insight here is that it helps to separate out the various decision components and to construct designs that address each issue separately. Right? So uh, maybe in a couple of minutes, I'll just post a uh, few questions and comments. So one thing is that the authors look at multiple sellers, uh, settings with multiple seller. And in that case, it turns out that uh, 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 confounding all the sellers sometimes may not be possible. There may not be a, a promotion policies that confound all the sellers, keep their beliefs a constant. They show that in that case, confounding one seller is beneficial, but here the concern is that once you pick out one seller uh, to confound, uh, that seems like a bit unfair to the sellers, right? But uh, this is just a feeling. The question is like, is that really unfair or is it like, are they still better off, right? So more broadly, the current analysis does not take into account the seller's payoffs, right? So we wanna ask what is the impact of confounding policies on the sellers? Uh, the other thing is that uh, the, uh, right now the assumption is that uh, because they are looking at the context of buy box, it's assum assumed that the non-promoted sellers only see demand from patient bias, right? Impatient bias do not see non-promoted sellers, right? So the implicit assumption here is that the platform always promotes some seller, right? But uh, there are other settings where the platform promotes uh, products or sellers, right? Uh, for example, if you just search for some French press, there are some uh, items will have these promotions like Amazon's choice or bestsellers compared to others. So in this setting, uh, even an impatient buyer may see buy some uh, 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 non-promoted items, right? So it would be nice to relax this assumption to have broader applicability, uh, but that is something that the authors can think about. Right, and uh, there are a bunch of future directions, but in, in the interest of time, maybe I'll just uh, mention this uh, to the Kilan directory. Right. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Ilan, it seems that your internet connection is stable again. Um, um, maybe you want to say anything uh, um, in addition to what you were saying before. Um, and also if people have questions, this will be a good time to ask questions to um, the speaker and, and Chris. Yeah, no, th thanks so much, Chris, for, um, let, let me, I have joined the Zoom in my phone as a backup, so let me quit. Uh, thanks for a uh, very nice discussion, and especially that figure that you had there, it's like very, it's very clear and it's like really impressive that after <laughs> you know, reading the paper, you, you, you get it. And we, I did, didn't have even that figure in my, in my head. So I might, I might eventually steal it from you if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, 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 and I wonder actually if the, the approach as you mentioned it as this a composition may have a broader applicability to like the pricing setting that we have. Of course, our problem has a lot of structure and we can do this the composition, but I, I haven't really thought about what structure is from the problem and what structure can be generalized to a, a broader uh, setting. Um, the uh, About the, the questions that, that you have, let me maybe, maybe first briefly uh, discuss the second one. So you mentioned about this Amazon choice budgets and bestseller. Uh, I, I think that's yeah, that's very fair. Like there are other other sources of learning and information for consumers. So two comments on that. We have, uh, so, so one of our extensions uh, that I think it's like the less highlighted in the paper, it's, uh, it's making the demand structure a bit less kind of binary. So in, in that extension, we allow even patient consumers to be affected by promotion uh, policies and impatient consumers also to consider non-promoted items 
options, but of course with different degrees of, of consideration. But I take your point totally that you know the, this kind of signaling from platform, in addition to you know this is like a better product, is is not necessarily captured. That, that part wouldn't be captured there. Uh, that said, I think that, that that setting is more reflective of kind of consumers having uncertain quality information about the products because you know you have these 1,000 French presses, but which one is really the good one? That quality uncertainty we don't have it in the model, uh, but but it would be definitely very interesting to to consider that uh, yeah. that kind yeah, of that signal. Was, that was one of my future extension re recommendations. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, and and about the competing center and the fairness, yeah, that, like definitely, if you see the framework, the formulation of the problem, you know, in in a sense, it can be offered because we have different promotion policies for each of the sellers. So the seller with high demand will have a specific a function for that seller and the seller for with low demand will have another function. Now, uh, arguably, when, when both sellers are identical, you can, in some cases, I believe I would need to check this, but of the top of my head, I think we did verify that you can choose the same policy for either of the sellers. So, Essentially, if we if we would have perfectly comparable sellers, we could use the same function on, on each of them. Having said that, it's still you would choose one of them to learn and one of them not to learn. And arguably, we could do this with some randomization to kind of be more fair, I think. But yes, there is a you have a point there in that we would be treating different sellers differently and and not considering uh, their payoff. So yeah, it it could be. Intuitively, I think it could be that by confounding the high demand seller, we would be helping the low demand sellers. So that could be good for the kind of small seller, but I'm not sure about this. This is just some, some intuition that I think would hold. But yeah, that's a, also a very fair, fair point. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Ilan, Chris, Philippe, Raghav, um, all our speakers and discussant. I believe we had a great session. And as I mentioned, we can all move back to the uh, virtual platform and continue this discussion. So thank you all for attending this.